next we're going to start thinking about uh, synaptically based long-term memory. These changes in synaptic weights will go a little bit more into the taxonomy, this organization of different types of memory, uh, and then focus specifically on the episodic memory as we discussed. And so this is kind of the classic uh, version of the uh, organization of long-term memory. So as you look at this, I think it's useful to think about like, you know, is this really the best way to organize uh, memory? And in some ways, I think it's, it's very intuitive. Uh, it's certainly something that, that a lot of people kind of resonate with. On the other hand, it's a little bit ambiguous in many cases, the, the exact basis of these things, and also uh, hard uh, to apply some of these concepts to not people, to other animals. Um, so right here at the top, if we think about the difference between explicit memory and implicit memory, that's fundamentally about consciousness. And so we're putting consciousness right into like the front line, most high level kind of division of our memory systems. Um, consciousness is something that that can be not is not you know uniquely associated with a particular brain area or a particular brain mechanism. Um, and so, uh, it's a little bit dicey to kind of make that such a pillar of what we're, uh, how we're organizing our memory systems. It is something that is intuitively uh, appealing. We can, as subjective human beings with our brains, we can immediately understand what we're talking about when we say explicit, okay, memories that I can actually think about and activate implicit other stuff that, you know, I may kind of exhibit some memory but I don't really know that I have that memory, right? And in the category of explicit memory, we have episodic memory. Again, this notion about all these kind of subjective first-person experiences. Um, and those are contrasted with uh, semantic memory, which is uh, your explicit declarative. Your, another word for explicit is declarative. Your ability to declare knowledge about the world, things you can say. The capital of France is Paris capital of New York is not New York City, but rather Albany. On the other hand, you have a lot of semantic knowledge uh, that maybe you can't really explain that well, right? Um, and this shades into this notion of like procedural memory. Uh, and so like, what about typing? Typing is very much a procedural memory, but on the other hand, uh, sometimes I can access that information. Like uh, I use the editor Emacs, um, and so the keys that I know how to type, I know those kind of implicitly, procedurally, but I also can sometimes tell you, you know, what it is, the key sequence that I use. So this, again, this notion of like, is it explicit, is it implicit? Eh, it's a little bit of both, right? But on the other hand, uh, there are certainly procedural things that are much harder to describe. Um, and this, again, relates to the notion that uh, a lot of our sensory motor knowledge is in parietal lobe, also in the cerebellum, um, and these are brain systems that we don't have a lot of conscious access to. So it, again, it does sort of make sense to, to organize it this way, it's just not the best kind of formal definition. Also in the category of procedural memory, we have um, the contributions of the basal ganglia. Uh, in the really classic version of this diagram, um, really, the, the basal ganglia was associated with uh, habit memory, habitual knowledge. Um, that turns out really not to be the case, and more or less, uh, the basal ganglia is important for uh, decision making and, and typically actually is much more involved in this kind of more deliberative, explicit kind of uh, reasoning processes, um, not so much in the habitual learning, which actually may be more encoded directly in the cortex itself. But in any case, uh, the basal ganglia is also a brain structure that we don't have direct conscious access to. And so that does kind of fit in this implicit memory category. And we could think about that as more like in intuition, the basis, the, the memory that gives rise to intuition. And then lastly, over here, we have uh, the priming. Um, these are things where, you, again, you don't explicitly know that you saw this item before. The, the classic example, of course, is the um, subliminal priming uh, where TV 
advertisements are flashing up you know go buy a coke and then you're gonna go go get a coke and you don't you never knew you saw that that little flashed sign but all of a sudden your brain says I want that right um, and so that's kind of how these priming effects works you don't really know that you've had that experience you can't remember explicitly that experience and yet you can see some trace of it some priming like effect um, that shapes your uh, subsequent behavior and these are really uh, embedded changes, small changes in synaptic weights that don't add up to like a whole new kind of chunk of knowledge on its own, but really have just kind of shaped the pathways in your brain in ways that we can measure. So all of these things can be understood in terms of underlying neural mechanisms. It just may not be the clearest way to, to kind of organize it. Here's another organization of uh, long-term memory in terms of how they relate to brain mechanisms um, where we have this kind of notion of this explicit conscious declarative stuff involving hippocampus for episodic memory and other areas of association cortex for semantic knowledge and then uh, in the implicit side uh, various forms of uh, learning in the um, cerebellum basal ganglia uh, and again, we don't really think this is a perfect example of what's going on. Uh, but, you know, if you want to lump together those different uh, uh, neural mechanisms and call them kind of implicit memory, that's fine. Um, but, you know, we know that the basal ganglia and the, and the cerebellum are doing very different things uh, from our ex exploration in the previous chapter.